outro cast. Can you hear me there, Nate? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can see you. Thank you for your time. My uh, pleasure. Good, good day for you, aside from having to talk to elite media scum. <laughs> yes. Every day is a good day when you get to talk to elite media scum. <laughs> well, we were connected to talk about the upcoming show at the PlayStation Theater in New York, which I think has changed names to the Palladium, and it used to be the Nokia Theater. Whatever it is, it's in Times Square. Is that a venue you've been to before? So, I don't know. I think we're actually, we're playing the Manhattan Center Grand Ballroom now. It changed. Which, okay. Uh, yeah, on West 34th Street, which I believe is the former Hammerstein Ballroom. Wow. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I don't think we're in the big, the big Nokia, old, old Nokia, old Best Buy, old PlayStation. It was fun. been. A, I've I was in New York when it was like all of those things. So, um, I, I, I'm corrected. Well, the new venue you're playing at, WWF, now WWE, used to tape Monday Night Raw in that same venue. So, I mean, oh, right on, really excellent. History for decades now. That's awesome. So, yes, the Manhattan Center. Double checking my facts there. Well, that is a cool venue for a seated theatrical kind of presentation. Is that the average kind of venue on this tour? Or is it sometimes the screen is over here and sometimes the screen is over there? <laughs> so for us, it's more, more, the stage is basically, our setup is always the same. Um, the venues, the, the average theater that we play in is like your, your traditional seated, you know, stadium you know with balconies potentially uh theater um but we've done a couple of quote arena shows where um it's been on a big elevated stage but our presentation uh is is always the same so the screen is always in the same spot is it that certain markets it's a stronger crowd so therefore you can go the arena rock star level uh it depends it depends on the you know it's so it's it's wild i think i think our show works better in a more quote intimate setting mm -hmm. to kind of give you that you know the whole premise of the show is watching a movie yeah. in a in a theater so playing that in an actual theater setting just kind of hits a little stronger than it does with an arena show but i think to, more to your point there is definitely uh the fan base enough to to fill a uh, certain you know big venues like that like an arena-esque setting there you go hey i think it will play well anywhere it plays but but over to you here for a second sure, your sure. credits are super interesting in that <laughs> not just a puppeteer mm -hmm. not just an improv oriented comic but also an announcer you had a great tv gig a show that millions of people watched every day what was the original plan was it to be more of a performance oriented comic and you just picked up other trades and skills? Um, that's a fantastic question. Actually, so my my Genesis, my Sega Genesis as it I, were. 16 bit of humor. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, my my Sega Genesis into the world of performing arts was was through puppetry. Puppetry was my gateway drug, if you will, into performance. And um, I've spoken a little bit about this before when asked, like, how'd you get into this kind of wacky, crazy business and get to do all these things that you do? And puppetry was really my, my gateway. It really opened my eyes into this world of performance art uh, that I was not really expecting. It was just more of, I'm a, I'm a child of the 80s, to date me a little bit. And sure. um, I, Fraggle Rock was the, was the show that I say was the light switch moment for me where I could, was watching it as a kid and enjoying it and loving it, fully invested in the characters and the storyline. And then there's, a, there's this vivid moment in my memory of a light switch going, how do they do that? Like, I, I get, it's, I've processed it enough. I've, I've aged to the point where I get that those characters aren't real and moving mm -hmm. by themselves. Somebody is doing that. And that fascinated me. I needed to know what was happening below the frame. And... I say, you know, back in back in the mid '80s, kids, there wasn't a thing called the Google. There wasn't right. a thing called the YouTube. Right. There was a place called the library where you had you know, to go and get these. When your parents wouldn't give you money, so you'd have to watch what was free and on the shelf. <laughs> exactly. And so, hence seeing Police Academy three before you saw Police Academy one. 
Or right, back. exactly, because that's the one that they played all the time on HBO, and you taped it. <laughs> yeah. um, so I took a, I, I checked out every book I could about puppetry and just engulfed myself in the knowledge of that. And the further that I dived deep into like how puppets were created and the history of performance, uh, you know, of people just telling stories through the art of puppetry, just further fascinated me. I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to be a puppeteer. And so through that is where it, everything then kind of rolled in and started to kind of fit like little puzzle pieces. And like, as I was doing that, I found that I had this proclivity for voice work and character building. And, and, and so I also then studied, you know, the traditional acting and musical theater and things like that, always incorporating puppetry elements whenever I could. So it was just like layer upon layer of these kind of skill set throughout this passion of mine and cut to present day where it's all just kind of like, led to this moment where I have this opportunity. Part of that in the late 80s, I've, put, I, I've been with the, with the show as a fan since 1989 when it went mm -hmm. to the Comedy Channel and have been diehard ever since. And so when this opportunity came about to audition to be a part of the show, having I, I have never felt more like taken aback, more nervous, more excited, and more fully prepared than I have ever been. I was like, I, I, I spent 30 years of my life preparing to audition for this moment. Unbeknownst to myself, it just kind of all, the opportunity met the preparation and it all just kind of worked out. So yes, and to, more to your point, so once I started doing into voice work, when I moved, made the move to New York after college, I engulfed myself in the puppetry scene and working with uh, Henson's and um, the Sesame Street and all of the phenomenal performers and puppeteers through there. They were like, hey, have you ever thought about voice work? And I really hadn't. I was solely focused. I just want to be a puppeteer. And uh, I hadn't really focused on that as a separate thing. Um, and they were like, you have the ability to potentially like pursue something like that. You should really think about it. So here's what you should do. These are the kind of classes you should take and da da da. Right. And I spent the better part of a decade in New York really uh, then kind of doing voice work as well. And that kind of perpetuated my career in other places, cutting to the opportunity to be the promo and live show announcer for the Wendy Williams show and being able to say. How you doing? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Right. She's got that down. She's got that covered. But uh, when they needed a live from New York City. That was you. That was they. There I was. So I was able to meet that too. So well, yeah, it's, it's a wild ride. It's been a wild ride for sure. You answered a lot right there. And something that I don't think everybody kind of realizes to ruin all the magic of puppetry is that <laughs> sometimes the person doing the puppetry is not funny and they're not doing the voice. They're just doing the puppetry. And other times a person is doing the puppetry and the voice because they're a great improv person. The Fraggles, I had to do a junket a week and a half ago, or rather I got to do a junket with the, the Fraggles folks. Yeah. And I was blown away at how quick-witted they are and clean. That, oh, yeah. Like, anyone could be quick-witted. Not everyone could be quick-witted and clean. That is a fair point. That is a very fair and true assessment. <laughs> yeah, so there's different skills in terms of what the puppetry-oriented people can do. So it's interesting to hear that you start off as just want to do puppetry and then somebody realizing your talent and go, you can also do that. So here you are, MST3K, longtime fan, 30 years or so of fandom. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did you specifically audition or did they go, hey, you'd be right for it? Like somebody knew somebody. So, yeah. So traditionally, the show has always kind of been performed and, uh, you know, kind of cast in house, especially when it when it um, originated in Minneapolis with Joel and, and mm -hmm. his his group of uh, comedians and friends and stuff like that. And they put that together and it's always kind of rolled in from there. Um, yes. Like, oh, hey, you know, it'd be good. And then bringing in writers and that they knew um, for this most for the the I was cast along with everybody here in our current cast. Uh, mm -hmm. on the Time Bubble Tour, we were cast um, for the last tour just before COVID, um, the 2019-2020 uh, Great Cheesy Movie Circus Tour. And um, 
we that came about of bringing in all of these new cast members because this ver that new live version is going to be very different than what they had done previously. The last few live tours was very much a you know they really want to just take what it was done on TV and put it live on stage. So they brought out a big desk. They had the puppets and Joel and Jonah behind the desk interacting with it. And then oh we got movie sign. And then they would run behind the screen and create the silhouettes live on stage. The screen was right there on stage and presented as such. Funny story, a lot of people assumed, even though they were running around and doing the silhouettes live, a lot of people just kind of assumed that it was pre-recorded. So they did, a lot of people didn't catch wise that they were actually doing it live. Mm -hmm. Cut to this new version uh, for the Great Cheesy Movie Circus Tour. Joel really wanted to bring the bots out from behind the desk. He wanted them to be more than, you know, just the half a puppet or have like Tom Servo sitting on the desk. He really wanted, he wanted Crow to walk around. He wanted Crow to ride a unicycle. He wanted Crow to bounce on a pogo stick. And he wanted Servo to be able to fly around on stage. And so they developed uh, for this show of, you know, using working knowledge of stage puppetry uh, elements and illusions, if you will, on how to make these characters move and come alive on stage and really kind of uh, mask the performers a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, cool. We kind of use a little uh, 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 technique of black on black uh, puppetry. So we've created this little box that's a, basically a little tiny black box in the middle of the stage and it's lit very specifically so that just the robots are illuminated and we as the puppeteers behind them basically disappear. Mm. Um, and so that was a new thing for them to try. Um, so for that, there was a little bit of added puppetry elements, stage puppetry elements that the previous performers may not have been um, as adept at or, or felt comfortable doing. Um, in addition to that, it was a very long tour. It was almost like six months <laughs> of the tour the last time. And so there was a lot of, oh, I can't do it for that long. Um, so they were like, okay, well, I guess we're going to cast they're gonna they held their first ever like casting for the show um and yeah it was one of those they posted it in a lot of uh, the traditional places to cast for shows and touring shows right in new york, in new york and uh, all kind of all over the country and um you know and then a little bit of word of mouth and people were like oh hey you know what would be good for this let's send somebody you think that would be good for this this casting so i was thankfully anybody that spent more than five minutes with me in my lifetime knows how much uh the show it means to me so i got sent many times of people going did you see this did you see they're auditioning for your show um and so it was pretty amazing. So uh, to, to be thought of by many people to say, um, here you go, dude. This yeah. is this is what it's all been leading to. Um, and yeah, so that's how we all got cast. All of us as the new blood, the new cast got brought in through that casting process for the Great Cheesy Movie Circus Tour. And they liked us. They like us. And they kept us around. And we've since been able to write for the new season coming up. The fans took a shine to us, thankfully, and we are now part of the new season as well as the live cast. So um, we're doing uh, a few episodes in the new upcoming season. We got to write on it. Uh, we also got to write on this show, too, that we're currently doing uh, on the Time Bubble Tour, watching the movie Making Contact, which have you ever seen it, Darren? Have you seen I have it? not had the pleasure yet, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. Is it February 4th or February 5th? Um, my notes say February 5th at yes. the Grand Ballroom. That's when I'll be seeing it, huh? That's it. Saturday, February 5th, the Manhattan Center Grand Ballroom. That's right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so good. Good on you. There's We've run into maybe three people who have seen this movie prior. Mm -hmm. There was a couple of people that did it for homework, and we shamed them. We're like, how dare you? Why would you do that to yourself? Uh, but then there are others that, are, that were like, yeah, I watched it as a kid. I remember this movie from the 80s. And then there are people that think they saw this movie, but they realized, oh, no, I actually saw a better movie that this movie was really trying to rip off of. Um, it's, it's, it's a wild ride. This movie is fascinating. Um, so you're in for a treat, my friend. That's what, I'm gonna, that's what I'm telling you. And I'm proud of you for making the right choices in life, for not having watched this movie in your childhood. Thanks to, to the series that you're a part of, I, I've seen more bad movies than I can count. But my, Fair, same. My, but, my, I, but at least but with the safety, with the safety net. Like the MST has always been like that shield, yeah. like those, you know, strength in numbers. It's like that, that like together we can get through this. You know what yeah. I mean? Solidarity. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely some movies that 
MST has had that you're like, I've tried to watch without the show. You can't. And it's, no. it's, mm, it's, you can't, just can't, can't do, do it. it. You shouldn't do it. Don't waste those <laughs> brain cells. <laughs> but my, my last thing that I want to know comes out of curiosity here yeah. is with touring productions, there's always a specialist that can do anything. Like, for example, if you're a great accordion player, you have an accordion roadie on the road, because why wouldn't you have a specialist setting up your stuff so you can then go sell the merch afterwards and do the meeting greets? Are there puppet techs, puppet roadies? Is that a thing? So uh, yeah, traditionally, yes, they they're, they're typically are, depending on the production, depending on the needs of, of, of the puppetry elements that are in it um, and how they're designed. And like if something were to break and like who you would have the skill set to to fix them um so uh, uh officially I, I myself am the quote puppet captain of the of the tour um so i i am not only a croce robot but i also am the puppet captain so anything that breaks uh i fix along with the help of our uh, amazing swing uh kelsey brady she has uh, been our understudy on the road because again as a for a, for a touring show um, even in the best of times, but especially during COVID times, super important to have some backup. Um, yeah. So she is a, a, an amazing understudy. She covers Crow, um, she covers Emily, and she covers uh, Yvonne as Mega Cynthia and GPC. So she knows all of those roles. Um, and uh, she had to go in for me when I had to leave for some family reasons in the middle of the tour. But, and she went on as Crow, first ever female uh, performer of Crow, and she was amazing. Um, so uh, along with that show, she's also a very uh, adept uh, wrangler as well. We call them puppet wranglers, wranglers or puppet techs, if you will. Not roadies, not techs, <laughs> yeah. wranglers. Puppet wrangler, yeah, yeah. So uh, anytime something breaks or something needs a little touch up, a little tweak here and there, uh, she and I tag team and, and get it fixed and make sure that it's ready to rock and roll. Wow. So you are not only performing a performer, you're also teching it, you're wrangling it. So yet the continuation of Nate has too many jobs and too many skills <laughs> continues decades later. That's Nate, Yep, Nate is a workaholic slash glutton for punishment <laughs> slash multitasker. Can't stop, won't stop. Kind of Can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> well, Nate, thank you for your time and looking forward to that show, the future season of the show. And Thanks, man. great to see your continued success here. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure talking with you. I can't wait to hear uh, your thoughts on the show, what you think. Thanks, man. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. Awesome, man. You too. Bye-bye.